This program is intended to be general in nature and should not be used as a substitute for advice from a qualified health provider. On Health Matters Television for Life, Medical Myths. They're all over the internet and social media and some passed down from previous generations. If it's an incorrect message, it can be damaging. Or in some cases, helpful. There's a lot of good information out there uh, on the internet. You just really need to know where to look. Our panel of experts answers your questions as we prove or bust some common medical myths. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child, and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with, and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust? I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens, and welcome to Health Matters. Medical myths have been circulating pretty much since the beginning of medicine. The difference between then and now is that because of modern communication, information or misinformation can reach millions of people with just a single click. Tonight, our panel of experts will help us put some rumors to rest. Joining us is Dr. Susan Hecker. She is board certified in internal medicine and currently practices as a hospitalist at the Spokane Veterans Affairs Medical Center. She's also a clinical assistant professor with the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine at Washington State University. Miranda Helland is a registered dietitian at Kootenai Health. She is passionate about nutrition and enjoys working with complex GI patients in oncology nutrition, as well as NICU and critical care. Mike Nielsen is a certified strength coach and licensed sports nutritionist with U District PT and has been an adjunct professor for Gonzaga University since 2010, teaching health, human movement, and nutrition classes. He specializes in sports performance training and is the head strength and conditioning coach at Gonzaga University. Ann Roberts is board certified in a pediatrician and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She is a pediatrician at Providence Pediatrics and sees patients in Spokane Valley and Liberty Lake at Providence Valley Young People's Clinic. And I want to welcome the panel tonight. Thank you for being here. It's a very big topic. We also welcome uh, your questions by phone or by email and want to remind you too that we're also streaming tonight's show on Facebook and the panel going to do their very best to answer all the questions tonight. <laughs> it's a very broad topic that we're tackling, Dr. Hecker. Talk about uh, what we're talking about when we say medical myths. Yeah, so we're trying to differentiate between what is myth and what is fact. And a lot of times myths get started um, because of something that there was a, maybe a kernel of truth in and then over time things get added on or whatever the original intent was gets swayed or there's just misinformation in general. And it's really difficult to differentiate between what is myth and what is truth when you have all sorts of resources coming at you and grandma, of course, telling you mm -hmm. what she thinks is true. Um, and so trying to differentiate between two is hopefully what we can do today. Has the internet been a game changer? Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you can find all sorts of great information in there and you can find all sorts of things that are not at all helpful. So, all right, let's, yeah. we've, got, we've got quite a list for you tonight and we're gonna tackle as many as we can. And again, call in with your questions or email those questions to us. Uh, let's start with Miranda. Dietitian, eating fat makes you fat. Now that one's been around for a long time. That's a really good question and I think it is really relevant with the keto diet that came out because mm -hmm. if you think about that, people eat a lot of fat on the keto diet so then they lose weight. However, <clears throat> when we look at the keto diet, that's a whole other topic that I don't really want to get into, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy to eat a bunch of fat. And so there's a fine line. Mm -hmm. We do need fat, absolutely, and I think it's been taken to an extreme where fat's bad and we need to kind of reverse that thinking because when in the, I think it was the 20s, they, they decided fat was bad and so they cut it out of our food and instead of having fat, which tastes really well, tastes good, it, they added sugar and they added salt. 
And I believe we are addicted to sugar and salt today, and I feel like that's more harmful than the fat, which our body needs fat for mul multiple processes. And so it's important to focus on the types of fat and know that there's a difference. There's the two types, the saturated fat and the unsaturated fat. And I have my rule of thumb, saturated fat, you can really distinguish by its solid at room temperature, like your butter, your cream, your cheeses, coconut oil. That one, although people think is healthy, is mm -hmm. also a saturated fat, so you need to be careful when eating that. And then the unsaturated fats, we actually want to eat a lot more of, and so your olive oil, your avocados, nuts and seeds, peanut butter, I mean, those, fish, lots of fish. And so I don't think fat makes you fat. I'm actually more of an advocate that we need to eat more healthy, heart healthy fats, like those unsaturated fats that I mentioned, and kind of shy away from thinking if you eat too much fat that you're gonna get fat. Because I think research is now showing that it's actually sugar, and sugar definitely can lead to weight gain, heart disease, and all of that stuff. And it's, we're kind of coming away from, oh, it's fat. So. In my opinion, no, fat does not make you fat. <laughs> okay, very good. Let's go to our, our first question um, for Dr. Roberts. And this is uh, question number one. It's a video question that we have coming in. Do babies get a fever when they're teething? Ah, ah now yeah. I was told that when my babies yeah, were little. I think a lot of people have heard that. And teething does get blamed for a lot of symptoms, whether it's fever, uh, extreme fussiness, diarrhea, all kinds of things. and. Studies just really haven't shown that to be the case. Um, of course, all babies are gonna be going through teething, and most of the time, if you see any symptoms at all, um, they're gonna be mild. Things like maybe a little extra drooling, um, mouthing on things a little bit more, maybe mild dis gum discomfort, but not enough to make your baby really crying or fussy, um, and definitely not fever. That's um, not been shown by studies. So if baby does have a fever at the same time they're teething, they're not associated? Correct, yeah, so this is the age where babies are getting a lot of you know, viral illnesses and other things like that. So a lot of times they may have a cold or an ear infection or something at the same time they're teething. So the concern is if we kind of blame that uh, fever on teething or chalk it up to that, we may kind of delay figuring out what the real cause is or, you know, maybe missing something that needs treatment. Okay, so. very good to know. Mike, a lot of fitness information oh, out boy. there. Yes. And it's changing all <laughs> of the time. Lifting heavy weights bulks you up. Is oh, that a myth? I I, I wish it did, because I would probably <laughs> be filling out this uh, shirt if it did. Um, you know, the answer is a little bit more complicated than yes or no, but I would say, as a strength coach, uh, we design these programs for athletes for their goals. And so if you want to get, um, you know, gain mass or get big, part of it you can do is by lifting heavy weights. But if we have, uh, I love to train basketball players. I train the women's basketball team at Gonzaga University, and we lift heavy weights because they need to be strong but you manage the amount of volume or the amount of sets that they do so they can get strong and be explosive without putting on a lot of size. So I would say to, to uh, have heavy weights make you bulk up, you need to have a lot of volume. So instead of doing three sets, you might be doing five to 10 sets. And then the nutrition plays a huge role in it too. So um, it's a lot harder to bulk up than you think. Should you start with a small amount and then work your way up? Do you ever get to the point where you're plateauing with a certain amount of weight? And a little advice on how we begin. We always say we have two kinds of people. Half the athletes that we train want to bulk up. And so, um, you know, depending on their goal, let's just say if they are a basketball player that wants to be able to gain weight or mm -hmm. just an everyday person that wants to look good in their swimsuit, um, lifting heavy weights could be part of it, but we'd have to look and say, three sets is not gonna cut it. If you look at the bodybuilders and just doing uh, an exercise for the chest, the average person might do three sets of 10. Those bodybuilders might be doing 10 to 15 sets to, to gain that mass. So for people that wanna gain mass, you're gonna have to increase the amount of work that you're doing and eat a lot. And the other half of people I train say, I don't wanna get big, especially some of our female athletes that might come and say, oh, I'm afraid to lift heavy weights because I don't wanna look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you would say, well, to do that, you'd have to have a lot of volume. We could still get you stronger because um, if you want to prevent injury, if you want to have nice, strong bones, uh, lifting weights is part of that. Um, but we would just make sure that we put them on a program that manages the amount of uh, work that they're doing. So I would say it's really difficult to put on size. Um, you'd have to have a program that has a lot of volume. 
All right. So to worry, the, the common person shouldn't really be worrying too much about that. No, okay. no. Like I said, I, I wish that was the case because <laughs> um, I would be uh, looking a lot buffer. All right. We have another question. This one is for Dr. Hecker having to do with the flu. I read on the internet that a flu shot can give me the flu. Is that true? Oh, Dr. Hecker. <laughs> we <laughs> We are in flu season still. Yes, yeah. yes. It seems to be never ending sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so the flu shot is not going to give you the flu, but you may feel a little what we call fluish as your body is um, reacting to the flu vaccine. So you might have a little muscle aches or so forth, but it's not the actual flu itself. Um, and the other thing too is the vaccine takes about two weeks to become effective. So you may develop the flu in between because you haven't yet had a chance to become fully immunized. So that may be part of why people say, oh, I got the flu shot and I got the flu. It may have been that they contracted the flu just right mm. after the flu shot when it wasn't quite effective. What about the nasal spray versus the shot? Yeah, so there's been some back and forth on the nasal spray and the shot. Um, right now, the shot is the preferred method of obtaining the vaccination. Mm -hmm. Because I had also heard, <laughs> myth or, or truth, yeah. that you, you could possibly get the flu from the nasal spray. It, um, the possibility is perhaps there, but very, very small. If someone has a um, compromised immune system, that may be the case for them, but in, that's, in that case, no one would recommend that they receive the nasal form of the vaccine. Okay. Miranda, back to uh, nutrition and dietary needs. Do you really need eight glasses of water a day? That That's is a lot of water. Yeah, that's a good question. I would have to say yes and no to that. I really think we need to get away from these generic recommendations where it's just like everybody needs this. We all need 2,000 calories a day. We all need eight glasses of water. We are bio-individual. We are not the same. So water, your fluid intake is dependent on you and how big you are, small you are, how active you are. So I think it's a good baseline, but I don't think it's a rule of thumb. And also, I think you really need to be intuitive and listen to your body. You know, are you getting dehydrated? Then obviously you need to be drinking more, but you can also very easily get overhydrated too. And then some of those side effects are a little bit more extreme than being dehydrated. And so it's a fine line, mm -hmm. and I think that we shouldn't use that as a rule of thumb, as eight glasses. I think that we need to listen to our body, and yeah, we absolutely need water, and a lot of people don't drink enough water. They like to drink tea, which is dehydrating, and coffee, and soda, and so you're not going to get water in those beverages, and so you need to be sure if you aren't drinking, if you're drinking eight cups of something, and four of those cups are soda, tea, coffee, you absolutely need to drink more water. What are some of those signs if I'm not drinking enough water? I mean, thirst, obviously, yeah, thirst. but if you get to the, the point of thirst, are you? Yeah, they say if you are you have dry mouth, mm -hmm. you've already lost 2% of your body weight in water. So that is already an indication that you're dehydrated. And fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness are also signs of dehydration. So yeah, it can be dangerous to be dehydrated for long periods of time, and it's definitely not good for the body, but I don't think you necessarily need eight glasses okay. a day. And and the coffees and the teas are going to are going to dehydrate. Are you getting some? You're getting some level some. of hydration, right? Yeah, but it's it's not going to be hydrating to you. Your cells aren't going to use it as water to make new cells. And Dr. Roberts, that brings up a, mm -hmm. kind of a follow up question to um, to the kids. Um, drinking water or sports drinks right. um, after activities. What's recommended there? Do kids really need that hydration of a Gatorade type product? So no. Um, so <laughs> sports drinks for the typical pediatric patient or you know typical pediatric activities such as like a child soccer game or basketball game, it's not going to be necessary for them to drink Gatorade or Powerade or any of those types of sports drinks afterwards. Um, plain water is actually what we recommend as far as the safest um, hydration for kids during and after exercise. The sports drinks just kind of come along with a lot of extra sugar, which kind of we touched on um, how sugar kind of comes along with its own myriad of health 
concerns um, contributing to childhood obesity and tooth decay and things like that. So we really don't want to encourage that. And getting them um, started on those kind of sets a pattern right, as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. So water is really best. Um, it's going to be the rare case when you know a child's exercising vigorously enough for a prolonged period of time where you're going to think about electrolyte needs and things like that. Really, water is going to give them everything they need. So. Mm -hmm. What about athletes uh, on that same topic? Yeah, we, typically if the activity is less than an hour, we're recommending water. And um, it, for something like a soccer game that they might be on the field 45 minutes before, it's an hour and a half, we'll do things like maybe oranges. Um, we will do some sport drinks too, uh, not just for electrolytes, but get them some simple sugars that they might be able to use instead of breaking down muscle glycogen. So um, for those longer endurance athletes, for sure they're going to need some of that fuel. Uh, for people like me, like I love basketball, um, I play every weekend and water is the best. Okay, we have our first question coming in from Bree in Spokane. Good evening, Bree. Hi, good evening. And you have a question? Yes, I have a question for Miranda, the dietitian. Uh huh. So um, I drink a lot of LaCroix and sparkling water, and so I'm wondering will that hydrate me or does that dehydrate me? I love that question. We just had some research come out of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics on this topic, and it is hydrating. It is just as hydrating as water, which I think is great because a lot of people are choosing to drink the sparkling water and the LaCroix. My sister's kind of getting me on board with it. I was kind of like, no, I don't like it, but it's an acquired taste. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think you, you can drink those things because there's no sugar in them. There's nothing that's going to dehydrate you. And so, Looking and the carbonation the, doesn't have no, any effect? No, there's no effect. And looking at the studies, they all said it's just as hydrating as water. Well, that's very good that's to good know. Reason. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hector, this one is straight out of my family. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> true confession. Yeah, yeah. Um, using butter to soothe a burn. Oh, my. <laughs> now, this goes back a few years. I don't think anybody in the family is still doing this, but I've heard this pop up a few times. Yes, yes. Um, I think the origins may have come from it being a soothing type of balm, if you will. But the concern is that um, the butter will serve as a sealant, if you will, and um, trap in the heat from the burn and cause your skin to burn perhaps a little bit more. So the best thing to do is to get the burn under cold running water right away and to keep it there for quite some time, um, at probably around 10 minutes or so to really knock the burn down. But putting anything on top of it is not going to be helpful and might prolong well, and, the agony. Well, and could there be some <laughs> concern about infection as well with something like that? Yeah, or probably not too okay. much unless you have a really severe burn, which in case you're probably seeking medical treatment anyways. Okay, stay yeah. away from the butter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to be in trouble with the family too <laughs> for that one. Yeah. All right, we have a, a question for Mike um, having to do with uh, targeting uh, problem areas. Is it true that I can target problem areas when I want to burn fat? Can you do that, Mike? Unfortunately, you cannot. Oh, you, you, you just can, burst my bubble. I know. <laughs> I, I wish you could choose where you put on the fat. That would be really nice, once again, to put it on the biceps. Uh, you can't choose where you burn it either. And so uh, I get sucked into those late night infomercials watching people do the ab machines. And you are building muscle there. Um, but unfortunately, the fat is going to stay there, and that's what's kind of not giving you the six-pack look. Um, what we recommend is general exercise, especially things like squats, lunges, presses, compound movements that are uh, involving large muscle groups, thus can help burn fat everywhere, not just in the legs when you're doing the lunges, but also in the abdo abdominals or the target areas. So I would say if you're looking to burn fat, a general exercise program is better than doing crunches combined with all the advice you're giving, which is good nutrition. Um, I always say you can't outwork a bad diet, so the nutrition piece is probably going to be the biggest thing that you could do to kind of lean up for summertime. So you can do crunches all day long. It's not going to make a difference. Well, no, it, it, it might At even be worse. At least when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? It well, might even be worse? Well, just because uh, you're building muscle there, but uh, you're not necessarily burning the fat. So in theory, you could be increasing the size of your obliques, uh, and then you have fat on top of it. So I would suggest yeah, like things like lunges, running, presses, uh, those general movements that are going to be involving more than just one group of exercises. Okay, very good. Dr. Roberts, back to you. Green nasal drainage on a child or a baby is an indication of infection. 
So uh, that's sort of a complicated one. So it is, it does indicate maybe some infection, but the question is, is it a viral infection like a common cold or the less rare, or the, sorry, the less commonly seen bacterial infection or sinusitis that would require an antibiotic or some sort of treatment that way. So kids with colds are gonna have all different colors of <laughs> nasal drainage. It's gonna go from clear to yellow to green, sometimes back to clear again before the cold is on its way out. So every green runny nose definitely doesn't mean you need to have your kid on an antibiotic. In fact, antibiotics just don't really help at all with viral illnesses, and we'd like to avoid using them when we don't need them. Um, so rather than looking at the color of the drainage, it's sometimes more helpful just to kind of look at how long is your child sick? Are they acting sicker than you'd expect with a normal cold? Sometimes things like fevers can be helpful to know. Um, you can get a fever with a viral cold, but usually it's gonna be pretty mild and early on in the illness. Um, if you're getting a fever later on, that might suggest more of a bacterial complication, mm -hmm. such as and, a sinus infection. And with a fever, um, should you always see a doctor? Should um, you take it the depends child on the doctor? age of your child. So for babies under two months of age, we always want them seen for fevers. Mm -hmm. They're just not as good at fighting off infections. Mm -hmm. um, their infections can be more serious for that reason. They don't show us very well um, what's going on with them. So under two months of age, any fever at all, and that's 100.4 rectally, that's kind of our marker. We want them seen right away. Um, older kids, it depends. It kind of depends on how your child is acting, You know, if they're acting happy and playful and eating well and everything else and the fever is brief and mild. Not necessarily. It's still not a bad thing to call us and talk to a nurse or you know, find out if we'd like you to come in and have your child seen, just to make sure though. And does it always mean, I'm following up here again, yeah. um, with some pediatricians I know will say it's good for to have a fever. It means that the child is fighting. Correct. Yeah, that's true too. So a lot of people are, are really uh, frightened of fevers and they can be a scary thing for parents. Um, they do indicate usually that there's something going on, mm -hmm. some kind of illness, um, and they do warrant looking into to figure out what's going on. But fevers do help us fight infections and it's kind of the na body's natural defense mechanism. And so um, they don't have to be kind of managed really aggressively or you know, uh, things of that nature in most kids mm -hmm. when they're otherwise doing well. Um, so for example, like round the clock, uh, Tylenol or, or alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen usually isn't necessary to address most fevers. Okay, so. very good. Tim in Spokane says, I just heard a news report that says sitting is the new smoking. Is that true and what does that mean? <laughs> this one's been out for the last month or two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a report that came out. Um, well, if sitting is bad as smoking, then I'm pretty you know, scared that we're sitting here at this table at the moment, um, but it's not true. It has a shock factor to yeah, it, right. for sure. Yes, yeah, for sure. So um, smoking, the, why that came about is that sitting for more than eight hours a day is associated with some increase in chronic disease and premature death, a scary sound as that is, but that's only about 10 or 20% versus smoking, which is 180%. So there is a very small amount of increase there, but not to the extent that smoking is. So the takeaway is to, if you are sedentary at your job, make sure they're getting out and exercising and doing a little bit of movement when you get home. Mm -hmm. If you have a desk job, get up, walk around every Ex now and then. Exactly, and go, you know, making an excuse to go visit your friends, grab a cup of coffee, just getting up and being active. Okay, well that is good to know. We have a question coming in on the phone from Fran in Calgary. Hi Fran. Hi, how are you? Very good, thank you. You have a question? Um, I did, uh, yeah, I'd like to know if you'd be willing to tackle the mythology that's going around by the anti-vaxxers. Well, that, we were definitely gonna get into that this evening, <laughs> yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Dr. Roberts, a lot sure. of talk about um, whether people should vaccinate, especially with the measles outbreak that we've recently seen. Yes, absolutely. So as a pediatrician, as you can imagine, uh, we do a lot of vaccinating in our office and um, vaccines you know, play a really critical role in keeping kids healthy, um, preventing preventable illnesses and things of that sort. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation out there, things that have caused um, parents to be fearful about vaccination and perhaps even choose not to vaccinate their child, which then in turn can leave them unprotected. So that's a big concern for us. Um, one of the big things is the, you know, it does do vaccines cause autism mm -hmm. and um, that's been very well studied luckily um, and has been shown not to be the case. Um, many, many studies have been shown, done and show no association between those things. Um, there were some infamous studies done back in the 90s, um, which are 
kind of infamous at this point, people um, have definitely heard about them, um, that suggested a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Um, and those have subsequently been retracted, not only because they were scientifically flawed, but found to be, in fact, fraudulent. Um, the doctor that conducted those has lost his medical license, things of that nature. And since that time, there's been a lot of work to try to reverse the damage that's been done by those studies. Um, so a lot of information is out there now um, that makes us very reassured to tell people that there is no no, um, no association between those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so with the things like the, the measles outbreak, unfortunately a lot of that hesitancy that probably stemmed from that um, has contributed to the resurgence of those diseases, measles and mumps and things like that. Mm -hmm. so Coming back concern. the way they have. Yes. Well, in fact, we have our story that it does have a connection to that. Uh, a doctor with Multicare Rockwood Spokane on a mission to just make sure people get the right information. Like most family physicians, Dr. Gretchen LaSalle thinks she's heard it all until she hears more. I uh, had folks follow barefoot therapies who are diabetic, which is scary for a diabetic to go barefoot to heal themselves. I've had people with cancer think that ionic water was going to heal them. There's a lot of medical myths out there. But unlike many in her profession, she's put in countless hours of research to debunk these myths and provide tangible data for her colleagues and for her patients. I got into this because I felt like I didn't have all the answers my patients needed and I, I, I wanted for myself to do the research to debunk all of the things I was hearing in my office that I knew weren't true but didn't have the data to back up. The main focus of her research has been to set the record straight on vaccinations a daunting task given the sheer volume of information and misinformation now available to everyone. Well, ever since there have been vaccines, there have been sort of an anti-vaccine sentiment and movement. But since we've got the Internet and social media, that's really how things have spread as quickly as they have. In 1998, a British physician published a case study suggesting a link between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and autism. That study involving just 12 children exploded on the internet and in the news media, creating an anti-vaccine movement. That one took off like crazy and is still existing today even though millions of children have now been studied in multiple research projects showing no link between MMR and autism. 20 years later, people are still afraid. A measles outbreak in the northwest part of the country is leading to new concerns about a lack of vaccinations in some communities and just who may have been exposed to the infectious disease. Parents call the shots. Parents call the shots. Everybody wants to do what's best for their child, and if they hear something that is frightening, that makes them think by giving a vaccine they're going to do something that's harmful, they're not going to do it. Dr. LaSalle doesn't want to discourage people from doing their own research, but does suggest vetting the information that they get to be sure it's up to date and coming from a reputable source. Things like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institutes of Health, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, that sort of thing. She also suggests checking out the credentials of the person authoring the information. There are a lot of mommy blogs out there written by people who don't necessarily have a scientific background. And whether it's vaccinations, weight loss plans, herbal remedies, or what have you, she hopes that people will talk to their doctors and that the doctors will have done their research. Doctors don't know everything we can't. Science doesn't know everything. We're still learning every day. So, um, you know, if our patients give us the chance to learn along with them and, and um, help them interpret what's out there, um, then I think we're going to keep them safe and healthy. And Dr. Roberts, would you like to follow up just a little bit with what Dr. LaSalle was, was talking about? Yes. And I'm sure you have parents coming to you and they are concerned. Definitely. And they just want to be good parents. Yeah, and we always are welcoming of those questions. We'd always be happy to have that conversation um, when families are bringing in their children for their uh, visits and things like that. Um, we do feel that vaccines serve such an important role and we want to make sure we can provide people with um, as much reassurance and education and other sources to look at and things of that nature too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And when people bring you that research, they've printed something off of the, the internet, Dr. Hecker, and, and they're convinced that what they're reading is the real deal and they present it to you as a doctor. Talk about that, how, do you, how you work with that patient. Well, I try to find what the fear is because there's usually a, a fear that drives that. And um, also behind that is wanting to do the right thing. 
And so trying to sift through the information to figure out what is the emotion driving that and then what's the um, facts behind that and trying to find a way to meld that together um, is it's often just a conversation to be had to make sure we're both on the same team um, and to go through that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Google isn't always the best <laughs> source. I know when you do search something on the internet, sometimes the first source that pops up is not the most reputable. Right. You need to dig a little bit deeper. Right, so companies can um, often pay to have their Google search come mm -hmm. up at the top. And so a lot of what you will get necessarily are ads and so forth. And so getting to those reputable sources that was mentioned, including the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, um, CDC and so forth, may take a little bit more digging into those. So, okay, very yeah. good. And we get back to the phone calls. Emily in Spokane. Hi, Emily. Hi. Thank you How for you? waiting. Of course, no problem. You have a question? Oh, yes. Um, so this isn't necessarily a myth, but a little bit of a clarification for me. Um, I'm really big into putting on sunscreen all the time, but particularly on my face. Um, I've not always worn sunscreen on my face, and I've read a lot of things that say, like, 20 SPF is fine. I've also read things that say that you should be going, like, full bore 50 SPF on your face every single day. Do you have any insight on that? Ah, Dr. Hecker. <laughs> yes, um, so I share that with you, being a fair-skinned person, um, <laughs> finding the SPS on my face frequently. Um, so I would, after about SPF of 50, you're not getting any more protection. Um, so that if you find a product which has that um, level, that would give you the maximum amount of protection. You don't need to go any further than that. Other than that, that's just kind of a marketing scheme. So um, I, I would imagine probably around a 50 um, to give yourself the most protection, both from sunburn as well as from the um, damage that can be caused to your skin. Okay, very good. Uh, another email coming in, this one from Clarence, who says, can stem cells regenerate hip tissue after surgery? Now, stem cells, thats we're opening a, a big can of worms with that one. Yeah. Uh, would anyone like to tackle that? That's out of my area. <laughs> <laughs> what do we know about stem cells? Oh, goodness, that is... <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have, I guess? Right, um, I think that's something that's very interesting and um, something that continuously is um, expanding our knowledge base. I myself do not have a lot of experience with that and would recommend finding a colleague that does. Okay, very sure. good. Miranda, I want to get back to you. Um, apple cider vinegar, where do we begin? Yes. There are a lot of claims about it. Um, everything from, you know, our, our gut health to topical applications. Mm -hmm. Is it really a cure-all? I don't think there's anything that's a cure-all. Right. And so when I was diving into this, I found some interesting things, just what people use them for. Oh, it's good for my hair. It balances my pH. It's good for my gut, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And there are some probiotics in it, but you have to remember that it has to have the mother with it, essentially. And, and when you get these pro products that are heavily processed, you're not going to have that natural probiotic. They do sell the unfiltered, unrefined ones, so potentially, I don't know, I didn't look into it that deeply. My issue with it is a lot of people tend to ingest it, they drink it, mm -hmm. and if you don't dilute it well enough, it can actually severely burn your esophagus, which can then alter your cells, put you more at risk for esophageal cancer, and then ulcers in your stomach, so if you're not diluting it enough, it can be really harmful to ingest. Putting it on your skin, your hair, Sure, I don't see if I don't see why there's a harm in trying that, but the evidence didn't point towards anything really confounding that I that really stood out to me, and so it's definitely I think more of a myth than a medical um, cure for for things. And the other thing about the pH, I mean, we know we've heard the alkaline diet. She mentioned mm -hmm. the ionized water for cancer patients, and I really did look into that and. That's 100% a myth and a scheme and marketing scheme. And it's unfortunate because those populations are really susceptible. They think, oh, if I balance my pH, I'm gonna fight the cancer, which yeah, you can change the pH of your urine. You can never change the pH of your blood. Our bodies will not do that, no matter what you eat. And so the only benefit, they said maybe it could prevent bladder cancer, but there was no definitive. I read a meta-analysis and they actually only found one study that even 
looked at the alkaline diet and cure for cancer or any of that. So I don't think balancing your pH is necessary. It's not going to prevent yeast infections and all of that jazz, but I don't necessarily think it's harmful to, to do it mm -hmm. if you like if you feel like it clears your skin up and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're ingesting it, maybe dilute it a little bit Definitely just to be sure. Definitely dilute it a lot. Okay. So that it does, if it burns, it's no good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, for Mike, let's uh, go back to our, our fitness questions. Um, running is better than walking. Oh, I would say uh, depend on who you're asking and who's it for. <laughs> uh, if we're looking at someone like my mom who is really active, uh -huh. uh, walking is definitely better than running. For the demands of her everyday life, um, what she likes to do, uh, for the health of her joints, just, just uh, for exercise purposes, I think going out on a brisk walk is great for. Um, if you're a competitive person uh, in sports that likes to play tennis or basketball, um, definitely running is going to prepare you for the demands of that sport. Uh, for fat loss, you're going to be burning more calories when you're running, um, but I think it's just so person dependent. So I would say it's a myth that one is better than the other. It all depends on your goals. Mm -hmm. And to be doing something. So to say, well, I'm not a runner, so then I don't go out and take a walk. Great That's point. counterproductive. Either one, you're winning. If you're getting <laughs> out and being active, you're winning. So yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, Daisy from Edmonton. Hi, Daisy. Hello. Good evening. You have a question? Good evening. Yes, I have a question with regards to the buttocks because I have a uh, schedule appointment uh, this coming May and uh, to fix my wrinkle on my bro. It's a uh, two, uh, two wrinkle on my bro in between. So, but then I did my reading from Dr. Google about mm -hmm. this embolus. So it's, it's scaring me now uh, to do the uh, Botox. Do you think it's, there is a high risk for me to develop this embolus? Hmm. Dr. Hecker? So Some concerns? the question is whether, I, I didn't hear the last part, a concern about developing an embolus, was that what your question was? Yes, the embolus, okay. you know, that will block my, 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 uh, my veins or my artery, um, I see. my veins on my mm, face, right. and then I will not, uh, you know, able to wake up and then die eventually. Right, that would be quite scary. The, um, if you're having the procedure done by a, um, a medical provider who has been trained in doing that um, and has done that frequently, it's injected superficially and you're not going to be at risk for that. So as long as you have someone who knows, is trained how to do it, um, is a trained medical professional and has done them frequently, um, I would not worry about that risk. Okay, very good, thank you. And we have an email from Ron who says, is smoking e-cigarettes or vaping an effective way to quit smoking? Is that a safe choice? Ron wonders. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> um, actually they have been looking at that and it, um, it is a way in order to stop smoking cigarettes and can be a, um, a tool to help you get off the cigarettes. The one thing that smoking e-cigarettes doesn't help with is that it doesn't help with the habit. Mm. So it's really easy to get back into the habit of cigarettes if you're still smoking. Um, it does address the, the nicotine and so forth of gain off of that, but may not address the habit. So it may be a little easier to fall back into that, um, into the cigarettes. Okay, so. very good. Dr. Roberts, eating chocolate gives you acne. Yeah, we hear that one a lot too. Um, uh, many, I still many... wonder that in my age. <laughs> well, let's talk about the kids. It would be nice <laughs> if there was something easy to blame. Um, but you know, as we know, most teenagers are going to experience at least some bit of acne during their teen years. Um, but chocolate, um, fatty foods, things like that, anything in the teen diet really isn't responsible for the acne. Um, it has more to do with just the hormone levels that are around at the time of puberty or a little before that. Um, those hormones kind of contribute to more oily secretions on our faces from the glands that are in our face. Um, that kind of contributes just to the clogging of those follicles in the skin and that along with kind of the dead skin cells that are slept off that just can kind of lead, kind of lead to inflammation and infection related with acne. Mm -hmm. but, but there's no food, unfortunately, that you can avoid to avoid breakouts. Okay. <laughs> as much as it's not a bad idea to avoid chocolate and fatty foods in excess, but right. it's not going to help the healthy not going to help us yeah. unfortunately. All right. yeah, Very so. good. Margaret calling in for tape from Tabor, Alberta. Good morning or good afternoon, Margaret. 
Hello, thank you. Hi. I um, was wondering, a few years ago, there was information circulating that women who take calcium supplements are more prone to heart attack. Hmm. There was some research. I do re recall that coming out about calcium. Miranda, do you know anything about the calcium association? I don't know necessarily with heart attacks. I do think that we get in trouble with supplements in general because we tend to take way more than we need. So I definitely could see how there could be a risk associated with that. And so I always just err on the side of caution with any supplement. Calcium, however, is often recommended. But a lot of the time, if you're getting asked to put on calcium, your doctor is normally recommending like a certain dose, like you need to have X amount of milligrams. And so I don't feel like it would be as risky, but if you're kind of just going to the store yourself and you see all the supplements and you see calcium, you're gonna probably just pick something. And it is good to take vitamin D with calcium because then it actually gets absorbed mm. and uptaked. So really, I think I don't, I can't speak to it 100%, but I just, those supplements can be dangerous. They really can. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hecker, you, do you have any information on that? Yeah, I think where that came from was that they found increased calcium deposited mm -hmm. in the um, heart arteries. Mm. Um, and that was more likely to happen if you took a calcium supplement. The best source of calcium is obviously in our diet. Um, but that being said, if you are, have a history of osteoporosis or osteopenia, so thinning of the bones, and your doctor recommends a calcium supplement, absolutely take it. There are very few instances in which you would not take that when you already have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Um, and the biggest risk with the calcium um, supplements is not necessarily that deposit into your mm. arteries, but more kidney stones. Mm. So if you've had a history of kidney stones, you're not going to want to take calcium supplementation in the form of a pill. You're going to want to get your calcium through your food. Mm -hmm. And do we typically, most of us, get our calcium through our food uh, in our regular diets, or are we lacking? Well, probably I would say in general we're probably lacking overall. Um, however, it's quite, it is easy to enough to get the amount of calcium that we need. We just have to kind of maybe make some tweaks here and there. Mm -hmm. Think about it a little bit more. Right, exactly. Okay. Well, make lactose this intolerance. If you're That's lactose true. intolerant, you can't eat dairy products and you might have a harder time. There are products though that are lactose free. Yeah, and I've been dairy free for 10 years and I've tracked my intake with my fitness pal, never have a problem reaching my calcium. Mm -hmm. What are other good sources besides dairy? Like broccoli and spinach are other ones. We fortify pretty much everything too. And so I do drink an alternative nut milk and it will be fortified with plenty of calcium. And then uh, just your grains and things like that also can be fortified. So okay. it's usually not a worry. Mary in La Crosse. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hi, you yeah, have a question? I was, yeah, I was wondering, is it a true or fake that you can get your fat out of your liver by drinking apple cider vinegar or lemonade? Okay, we, we tackled some of the claims about apple cider vinegar, but fat out of the liver, that's a new one. I would say no. Because it kind of goes to detoxing, and I just watched a big special on detoxing, and it's one of the biggest gimmicks that is out there. It's usually celebrity-derived, and there really is no research behind detoxing or getting anything to make your liver work better or your kidneys. I mean, your kidneys and your liver are designed to naturally detox. And so I would say that claim is false. What would you have to add to that? Um, unfortunately, we don't have any treatments yet to extract the fat once it's settled into the liver. I wish there was, and perhaps mm -hmm. that's coming down the road. Um, but right now, we don't, and I don't think that the apple cider vinegar would be the, the way to do that. Okay, and Mike, um, should you stretch out, stretch before you work out or after? I'm always confused by this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, controversial, but I think common sense helps a little bit, which is it depends on the activity that you're doing. So uh, you want to be able to warm up for, if you're doing a sport, warm up for the demands of that sport, which would mean going through a full range of motion. If you're um, running, you want to be able to get in that full stride length. If you're playing a sport like softball, you have to get in a deep squat. So I think the, the most important thing is not stretching, but warming the body up, preparing it, going through that range of motion with a little buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And then after the sport is finished, now your body's preparing for cool down. You'd want to rest in a lengthened state. So that would be a more appropriate time to do some uh, static stretching. Uh, there is research that shows, you know, for instance, if I do static stretching on my chest and then I go do a performance-based lift like a bench press, I'll actually be weaker in there. Um, so 
we have all our athletes warm up, dynamic warm up, some full range of motion uh, movements, but not static holding. Because if you're trying to gain range of motion before you go play, but you don't have control of that range of motion, you don't have strength, you might actually be setting yourself up for injury. So for me, for instance, what should I do then before I start lifting or, or get, what would be that, that mild warm up? Yeah, so I would say it depends if you're playing tennis versus lifting. Okay. If you're going to go lift, I say, well, are you doing a lower body, or upper body day, or a total body? So the first thing I do is let's increase your core temperature. Let's do some biking, some running, some skipping, okay. some moving. A little bit on the treadmill or something treadmill like that? Treadmill would be perfect. Okay. Bike would be perfect. And then if you're planning on doing a squat, for instance, well, you'd want to be able to do a body weight squat and prepare for that exercise before you load it. So you'd kind of mimic the demands of the sport. If you're going to play tennis, you'd want to get some light rotations, some light okay. shuffling. Um, so the static stretching would not be the appropriate thing to do before it be afterwards you do that. Okay, that's very good to know. We have another email, this one from Susan, who says, are there safe natural remedies for anxiety? Hmm. I can think of a couple. Um, Probably not the what you were referring to, but natural remedies for anxiety um, that can help sleep. Mm. Um, cannot um, emphasize the virtues of sleep enough. Um, so that in and of itself can be a huge improvement in terms of decreasing anxiety levels. Mm -hmm. um, Yoga? Um, yep, any of those. Meditation, meditation. mindfulness. A lot of those things, yeah. I yes. would agree with that. And another thing yeah. is exercise. I think yeah. that's one thing we try to really encourage our pediatric patients that come in with anxiety is to sleep for one thing, um, get off their screens, and try to exercise. So mm -hmm. I think those can be really helpful things. Mm -hmm. Because there are definite things that happen to us when we exercise. I mean, it changes our, our chemical makeup when we exercise. And so if, we, if we're anxious, it definitely helps get the blood flowing helps us to relax, doesn't it, Mike? I love I mean, that, and I think yeah. the biggest thing is just play. You know, yeah. I, even as Have an adult, yeah. I love to play because when you're doing, uh, and it's not all about sport, but that's just going into my world. When you're playing basketball, <laughs> I don't think about, uh, you know, the paperwork I have to do later on or the fight I might have got in earlier in the day. You're just thinking about being in the moment, and I think that uh, when when your when your breath, when your mind, when your body is all connected, I don't know if there's anything better. Okay. Another email, this one for Bob in Hayden, who says, what are the health risks of marijuana, especially for young people? What do we know? So, yeah, so marijuana um, it does have effects on the teen brain or on the child brain, probably different from how it affects an adult. Um, the brain in kids is still growing and uh, evolving and changing, and um, unfortunately those um, substances such as marijuana or even other substances like alcohol, uh, tobacco, can definitely have more of an impact um, on the developing brain. Um, some of the ill effects uh, can be uh, sort of uh, mood changes, kind of like what we were discussing, uh, depression and things like that, um, but just in general, just the safety is a huge concern in kids with, with substances. They're just not as well looked at in, in the pediatric population. So. Okay. We have a question for Miranda. This one having to do with the different kinds of sugars. I've heard that eating natural sugars like fruit is better than eating processed sugar. Is that true? Mm. Is sugar sugar? Technically, yes. The body looks at it as sugar, sugar, sugar. However, I do think there are benefits to eating something like fruit versus processed goods, and a lot of that's fiber. Fiber is my favorite thing. Fiber <laughs> is so important, and we tend not to get enough fiber in our diets, and fiber keeps us full. It prevents cardiovascular disease, and it is a huge player in colon health, especially prevention of colon cancer. So we need to eat our fiber. And when you're, for instance, you're eating that fruit, and you're, yes, you're having sugar, but you're getting the fiber versus eating something that's processed because the, the whole word process means they had to do something to that food to make it shelf stable. And so they usually have to add a lot of things to it, including more sugar because food needs to taste good, right? And then that is where we kind of fall into that, where that type of added sugar, which I'm so happy they changed the food labels to where it will actually tell you how much added sugar that you're eating now versus before it would say, oh, this has 15 grams of sugar, mm -hmm. but we didn't know that 13 grams of that was natural and two grams was something that was added. So I think that really plays a huge role, but the body and the science, I mean, sugar is sugar. Just because you go eat coconut sugar versus white sugar doesn't mean the coconut sugar is healthier or any of that. So. Definitely eat your, eat your veggies and your fruits for your fiber 
and don't worry so much about the sugar, but that way, if you are concerned about your added sugars, at least we have a way to track that now. Mm -hmm. And you, I, I guess you know for sure when you're eating a, a processed sugar, at least for the most part, if you're picking up a candy bar, you know mm -hmm. you're eating processed sugar. Mm -hmm. But you're not thinking about it so much when you eat an orange, no. but you are still getting sugar. You are, and that's why when you look at the recommendations for how much fruits and vegetables that you should have per day, it's five servings, half cup servings, so it's about the size of your fist of vegetables and only three of fruit. And it's really easy to eat a bunch of fruit. Like it tastes good. It's sweet and delicious. And, and you're so, telling yourself you're getting and you're telling yourself you're right? getting good nutrition. But really, we need to, we need to eat our vegetables, and we need to get our servings of vegetables in. However, like kids, we just want them to eat anything <laughs> with vitamins in it. So if they're going to eat fruit, I mean that's fine, and we want to encourage that. But I always tell I don't know if you say the same thing, but it can take 10 to 30 times for a child to try a vegetable or any food mm -hmm. before they like it. And so you have to keep you know my youngest it. daughter. <laughs> <laughs> And my son too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he, he yeah, doesn't she was like tricky. food. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we, there's a, just remembering that vegetables are definitely the home hitter, and that we need to limit our fruit because right. there are a lot of carbs in it too, and other stuff. So. All right. Very good. Good to know. Perry in Edmonton has been waiting. Hi, Perry. Hi there. I was just wondering if anything helps fungus and nails the fingernails. I understand that you can't... Hello? We're here. Did you have something more? Okay. I was just wondering if there is anything that could be done to the fungus in fingernails. I am losing my fingernails. Oh, goodness. And I understand that Nothing helps it. I did hear that if you use a vapor rub, it might help. Okay. But on the other hand, a pharmacist even told me that it would take a whole year. Hmm. Well, can we help out Perry at all? Yeah, um, fingernail fungus is a hard one. So once it sets up shop, it's as you are saying, it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, we do have some medications that come in a pill form, which can be helpful, um, but those are also a bit harsh on the can be harsh on the liver, and so that's something that your doctor can definitely look over to see if that would be of help, but. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's and that's really one hard. of those that really gets a lot of attention. Right. And some crazy remedies yeah. that you see pop up on the internet. Because it is so hard to get rid of. That's why you have so many other things that come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a podiatrist, podiatrist on the show recently who said that one of his patients told him that urine would work on toe fungus. <laughs> So he was. He said you would. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I thought, okay, I've heard, I think I've heard something about that before. Yes, yeah, some, some crazy things. So she should probably see a doctor, and maybe they can help her out with that medication. Especially if you're starting to lose your nails, that would I would definitely talk to the doctor about what options are available. Okay. I would kind of like to see if maybe you could look at the vitamins associated with nail growth, like biotin, collagen would also be another one. If you don't have nails and you need to grow them back. I love taking collagen. I take mm -hmm. it every day. Most of us drink a cup of coffee, and so I just put two tablespoons in my coffee, and it yeah. dissolves, and you get 11 grams of protein, and then all of the benefits of collagen, which is hair, skin, and nails. There needs to be a lot more research, definitely, mm -hmm. but if your nails are not, no longer there, I feel like if you tried to have a supplement to help grow try your nails, that. that maybe you could try that. Mm -hmm. And those are safe? Yes, they're yeah. safe. Biotin is also found in eggs, too, okay. so you could eat some eggs. Okay, very good. An email from Carol. I have 80 year, an 80-year-old uh, members in my women's fitness club. Should I have them rest more than one day a week? Should I recommend calcium and vitamin D supplements? Let's start with the fitness part of that. She's got some 80-year-olds in a fitness club. Yeah, I love being active every day. And so it depends on the intensity of the workout. And sometimes we think about, hey, I'm training, I'm working out. And mm -hmm. you think about a CrossFit workout, or we talked about Mark Wahlberg's crazy <laughs> fitness yeah. schedule that he does. And so if for sure you need a lot of rest between those training sessions. But being active, we talked about walking, we talked about 
yoga, um, just exercises where you're using your body weight, those are really healing to the body. So I would say um, if it's intense for that person, definitely a rest day uh, from that kind of activity would be good. But I would say the more we can be active, the better that's not too strenuous. Mm -hmm. And they should probably know if they have any aches or pains and things they need to rest, I would guess. Be intuitive of that. Yeah, uh, but inactivity, so you know, if you have, uh, my legs are sore from a mm -hmm. workout, sitting on the couch is not the best that's thing not for the, it. You know, even right with thing. our athletes after a really tough soccer game, we want to get the blood flowing, light movement, pain-free movement that actually helps the healing process. Okay, and then the second part of that had to do with recommending the, the calcium and vitamin D. I think we kind of talked about just like the osteoporosis, osteopenia, that's when I would do the calcium. And generally, a lot of people in their 80s have those disorders. So I would recommend that. And vitamin D goes a long way for this area. I think mm -hmm. pretty much we all need to be taking mm -hmm. vitamin D. I don't care your age. Just because even myself, I was low on vitamin D and just struggled with depression. And getting just my vitamin D level helped my depression mm -hmm. immensely. Like it went away. So we don't have enough vitamin D in this area. So definitely take vitamin mm -hmm. D. And then with the calcium, I think it wouldn't be harmful to someone in their 80s who probably has some form of osteopenia, osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, I would say definitely have them check with their doctor yeah. first because some of those supplements can impact the absorption of other medications mm -hmm. that you're on, um, particularly a thyroid medication or so forth. And so I would probably say I would agree most in general um, patients over the age of 80 probably would benefit from that, but definitely have a close discussion with your doctor. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to take a, a D supplement, how much? Um, There's a lot of different yes. thoughts on that. Well, and it depends on what your vitamin D levels are. So if you are deficient in vitamin D, we may be doing a really high dose vitamin D to get your levels up. If it's more of a maintenance, um, it may be around uh, 2,000 units or national units or so forth. So it just depends on where your levels are at. Okay, well, we have come to the close of our full hour here on Health Matters. So much information tonight. I want to thank all of you for being here and tackling some really tough questions for us. And I want to thank everybody who called or emailed questions as well. If you're looking for more on where to find medical information that you can trust, we have posted some links on the Health Matters webpage at ksps.org. Be sure to join us next month when we talk about getting fit and staying fit no matter what your age. That's Fitness for All, May 16th. Until then, I'm Teresa Lukens. Good night. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child, and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with, and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust? I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. 